I should start by uh, thanking Ian and the organizers of the uh, conference. This is, uh, I feel very privileged uh, to be invited to talk about uh, what I think uh, are sort of pressing and fascinating questions and to have a captive audience uh, because they are busy enjoying good food so you won't leave the room even, you know. So I do have a captive audience for 15 minutes. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to thank Rob Johnson for putting it all together and Bill Janeway for uh, being, uh, encouraging us to join in. Uh, uh, so uh, it wasn't clear to me what, I, what the ambit of the session was. Um, uh, and it occurred to me that it, this was a good forum to talk about what economists have been doing with regard to networks in the last decade or so. Um, I'm sure some of you are very well uh, aware of um, some of the exciting work that we've been doing, but um, uh, I thought I'd uh, make a pitch for some of this work, and um, I was going to try and motivate it um, through examples of uh, banking networks uh, because of the theme of this conference, but the I also wanted to make a more general point that uh, there are actually a number of general concerns, general questions that come up when we start thinking about financial networks. Uh, the kinds of questions we want to ask about financial networks and systemic risks, it turns out, <coughs> uh, share many common features with uh, many other networks. Uh, it could be the web, the World Wide Web. It could be... Uh, social networks, uh, it could be transport networks. Uh, and so it, it seemed to me uh, that I should exploit this opportunity to talk somewhat more generally, uh, keeping in mind the motivating example, but sort of bringing up a few sort of general concerns. Um, so once you begin to think about networks, um, you know, it seems like the most natural way to think about lots of different things. So here's some, here are some examples I've just put up. Uh, I'm going to be uh, sort of talking in fairly general terms, but you may want to fix your, in your mind your favorite network. You know, you may want to think about the web, you may want to think about um, the Guangxi, or you may want to think about interbank linkages. Uh, and then more or less everything I'm going to say today, um, you can think about in the context of the particular um, example you have in mind. So let's start uh, by just sort of asking, um, uh, and this has been one of the more fascinating strands of the work, um, is the measurement of networks and um, sort of look visualization of networks. Uh, and this has been made possible, of course, by the internet and the computing power revolution. So what do these networks look like? So here's a very simple small network, and uh, it, it turns out, for instance, if you read some recent um, work on financial networks, interbank networks, then um, they may have thousands of banks, but they display what um, network theorists refer to as the core periphery structure, which is simply a very small fraction of the entities, banks in this case, are fully connected up in a clique, and most other players are very, very poorly linked, but just one of the key players. So here's another example of a network. This is a a web um, a hyperlink network, and again we see similar features, tremendous inequality, centrality, a, a few key nodes, and if you start thinking of how far apart people are, you see that they're not actually very far apart because you can just walk down from um, uh, between any two nodes through the hub nodes. Okay, so here's a uh, co-author network. Uh, this is someone that many of us know, Jean Tirol. Uh, this is a co-author network. What is this saying? This is Tirol is in the center. Uh, uh, you can see him there. And basically, these are the co-authors of Jean Tirol in the decade of the 90s. These are uh, people in uh, with a um, yellow sort of uh, yellow nodes. And then you have the green nodes, who are people with whom the co-authors of Tyrol worked, and again you see um, um, this inequality in the connections. You see these small world features, um, and uh, here's another example of that. This is a, 
a network of firms which are collaborating. These are firms in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. And again, you see this core set of 24, 25 firms, which are very highly linked. And then you have hundreds of other firms which are peripheral. Um, and so let's just try and summarize this. Um, so this is something that um, there's a lot of empirical work ma mapping many, many different networks in different contexts. But some features of these networks um, have been highlighted. Um, the connections are typically they're very sparse. Networks are very sparse. So in, if you look at the Fedwire network, which maps the interbank uh, borrowing lending um, over, over time, this is from 2004, the number of banks we're looking at is about 5,000. Um, the average number of links is just three. So it's, it's, it's very sparse. Um, uh, notice that you could have up to 4,000 links. So it's a tiny, um, it's really a tiny number. But there are banks which have over 1,000 links. So it's a very unequal world. Um, the other feature I want to sort of emphasize here is average distances. Because you have these highly linked hubs, you can basically go from any bank to any other bank just by crossing through a hub. So that's a key feature of what makes this world very small. Uh, so this idea of small worlds, of course, goes back to Stanley Milgram's experiments in the 60s and even earlier, um, but it's been popularized uh, greatly by the watson strogatz paper in, in Nature. Um, so what we want to ask is really, why do networks have these, these architectures? What is it about, um, what are the causes? What causes these networks to be the way they are? Okay. So that's the first question we want to ask. So banks are uh, making choices about who they want to lend to, who they want to borrow from. Uh, similarly, researchers make choices about who they want to work with. Firms make choices about who they want to collaborate with or, or not collaborate with. So we are going to think very hard about what is driving this network, and we are going to start by looking at what are the incentives of people to form networks. And there are going to be a number of other issues that come in, of course. Um, you know, competition, we are going to be very interested in how market competition matters, how it shapes incentives to form networks. And once we've got a handle on what these networks, um, um, you know, where, how they're formed, we want, we're going to ask, why, do they, why should we care about them? What are their implications? So in particular, we're going to ask, what are the implications of these unequal small world networks? And in particular, we are going to be interested in the question of systemic risk and resilience. So are these networks particularly uh, attractive from the point of withstanding shocks? Or are they very vulnerable? Okay, are they robust in some sense? Um, then we're going to turn to the classical problem in, 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 in doing economics, which is um, we want to have an understanding of is there a role for public policy? Uh, when you start thinking about networks? Is there any sense in which um, when people create networks or when people behave in networks that their incentives are not aligned with what is collectively what we would like them to be doing? Um, uh, and if so, what is the sense in which networks shape these externalities um, and, 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 and create a role for public policy? So, just trying to keep an eye how much time do I have? Uh, five minutes, okay. So, so I'm going to rush through a bit. So, but that's sort of, what, we have, what we've been trying to do is, uh, as I said, try and develop a, a theory of why networks have these features. Of course, we, you know, there's a lot of work in, in other disciplines, especially in mathematics and physics, and uh, the speaker who will follow, Frank Kelly, will, will, will give you a sense of some of that work. What's, dis what's distinctive about economics is, of course, our interest in and our expertise in understanding incentives. And so that's what this research is, is, is trying to uh, get at. Okay, so let me, since I'm very short of time, um, so I've already talked about uh, links being created by deliberate choice. Um, a key feature of linking activity is externalities. So when bank one lends has a link with bank two and creates a new link with bank three, there are going to be effects on bank two, and, and these may not be internalized by the banks which are creating the links. The other key feature of networks, 
a lot of interesting networks is they are rather large. So 5,000 banks is, is a lot of nodes, and it can create a huge variety of networks. Typically, players in networks don't know the network very well. So you want to have a model of how do you function in networks, how do you create networks, when you don't know a great deal about the network. Okay. So, so I'll just, uh, from this slide, I just want to draw your attention to uh, three, pay, three books that have come out in the last couple of years which survey the economics literature on networks. Um, and I'm going to pass on, and there's a set of readings at the end of the talk as well. So let's sort of ask ourselves, why should we care about networks? So there are these beautiful pictures, there are these rather fancy sort of structures, but do we, why should, do, we, do they really matter for things that we care about? So for instance, do they matter if you're interested in epidemics? Do they matter if you're interested in financial contagion? Do they matter if you care about spams and viruses on computer networks? Um, so one of the interesting applications of this economic approach to doing networks is, is precisely um, to actually ask how activity in networks uh, is shaped by incentives uh, created by the structure of the network. So how the financial network structure is going to shape choices that banks make, for instance. Um, again, I'm not going to have time to talk about recent advances in the theory, but I just want to highlight uh, a recent paper that um, a few of us have, have put together, um, and it's just been published in the Review of, e of Economic Studies, which sort of brings together a number of key features of large networks. There are a large number of players. People don't know the network very well, so they have statistical information. They have some statistical uh, distribution, probabilistic information about the network. Um, and they try and do as well as possible, given that they are embedded in these networks. Um, what, in terms of the theory, we are at the point where we want to combine networks with things that economists are particularly good at understanding, which are competition and prices. So that's where the theoretical agenda is. Um, so I just want to wrap up by talking a bit about um, how, do we, how do we think about using networks, okay, what, what are the kind of uses we can, um, uh, of networks for policy purposes. So going back to the starting observations, so the key, um, so the, the key step in, in reasoning about public policy is of course that people are making choices, sometimes these choices are aligned with what we would want them to do, which is sort of collectively desirable, sometimes they're making choices, they're forming networks, or they do, they're making vaccination security choices, uh, or balance sheet choices which are not in line with what is collectively desirable. Okay, so what we want to do is to basically ask ourselves uh, what is the optimal network, if you like, what is, if you could choose a network, what would be the best network possible, and then ask if people were allowed to, and people are actually making choices and creating networks, will they create networks which are very suboptimal? Uh, if they will, what are the ways in which these networks are suboptimal? And what is the role for public policy? Uh, so in particular, there are two uh, practical questions that have been very much on the agenda. Should central banks prescribe network location and structure contingent regulations? So Andrew Haldane, in, his, uh, in a very widely publicized talk last year, um, uh, made this uh, plea that we should take networks seriously into monetary policy and, and indeed uh, regulation should be network structure and network location contingent. Um, this, of course, begs the question, um, uh, somehow there must be externalities. Banks must be doing something that they probably shouldn't be doing. And uh, we don't uh, really know for sure that is the case. Um, and uh, the theory at, the point, at this point doesn't actually say anything definitive on that. Similarly, we could ask whether banks should be um, prevented from forming certain links this is, of course, the heart of the um, Glass-Steagall um, Act. Certain things should not be allowed to certain banks. In other words, certain kinds of links should not be permitted to certain sorts of banks. So that raises the question, um, is there a sense in which links create externalities which banks don't internalize, and um, uh, they should there be, therefore be prevented from creating those externalities? And um, so we are just beginning to formulate formal models to pose and sort of study those questions. 
Okay, so here's a set of uh, sort of uh, recent publications which address some of these questions, and um, um, you know, so thank you. <laughs>